Hey there, amazing audience who've joined the revolving time today. Get ready to embark on an unforgettable adventure with us. Subscribe now and let's uncover the hidden secrets and truths together. Life has a curious way of throwing unexpected curveballs our way, doesn't it? Well my friends, today's story is published by Ohio. My wife had betrayed me with someone else, someone she knew from her past, so I'm doing this. I hope you will enjoy this. When I returned from lunch, it was lying with the rest of my mail in a pile on my desk. I get videotapes in the mail all the time I'm the co-owner of a video editing and production firm, but this one caught my eye because it was hand-addressed personally to Mark Bernier, in block letters, with no return address. I was bored with the editing job I was in the middle of. More to delay getting back to it than for any other reason, I opened the envelope. There was no note and the tape was unlabeled. I slid the rolling chair across my office to the VCR and popped in the tape. The tape was made by an amateur. It was a little grainy and underlit. I saw what looked like a bedroom with an unoccupied king-size bed. After a few moments a couple came in and began undressing one another. The man was a lean slick looking guy of about 30. The woman I could only see from behind, but she had a beautiful, shapely body. Within a minute or so, and without any romantic hugging or kissing, the couple was knack asterisk ed on the bed, engaged in serious foreplay. I wondered idly why some anonymous person would have gone to the trouble of sending me an amateur tape. Realizing that I might as well get back to work, I sighed and rolled over to the VCR to stop the tape. As I did so I glanced back at the screen. The woman was now astride the man and moving up and down. I could see her face clearly. The woman was Amy, my wife. I lunged for the VCR and hit stop. Then I sat back in my chair, stunned. Without moving, I pondered the total impossibility of what I had just seen. Until that afternoon I considered myself the luckiest and most happily married man in Cincinnati, if not in the entire state of Ohio. I loved Amy with all my heart, and I knew she adored me. We had been married about four and a half years, and I'd never had the slightest reason to suspect her of being unfaithful, or of being dissatisfied with me in any way. I stared across the room for many minutes, seeing nothing, my mind a whirl of confused and painful thoughts. I had no idea what to do I had no idea what this tape meant. Well, obviously I had some idea. My goddamn wife was cheating on me. But the when and where, and above all the why, were a total mystery. As my shock hardened into anger, I got to my feet and closed my office door. If nothing else, I needed to know more. I needed to see the whole tape. Update. I spent the rest of the afternoon watching, then re-watching the tape with a professional eye, trying to put aside my horror and simply see what was there to be seen. It was clearly an unedited original, made from a single camera presumably hidden in a bedroom somewhere. It showed two hours of Amy with the unknown man, in a variety of love acts. For some reason the sound on the tape was badly distorted, and I couldn't understand any of their words to one another. After the first duck, with Amy riding the man, they both rested for a few minutes. Grimly, thinking like a professional video editor and not a betrayed husband, I went through the tape again for any further clues that would help me understand why Amy could have done this. I didn't learn much. The bedroom was spacious and fancy clearly, its owner had money. There was enough natural light coming in through the windows to show that the tape was made during the day. The man was about 30, which would have made him three years or so older than Amy. He was attractive, I guess, but nothing special, and his tool was certainly no larger than mine. The tape had to have been shot about four or six months earlier. When she first came into the room Amy was wearing a locket I'd given her for our fourth wedding anniversary, about six months ago. But her hair was longer in the video than I had seen it lately, and I remembered her cutting it shorter about four months ago. The one thing that came through more and more clearly as I watched again was the contrast in their attitudes. The man was relaxed and enjoying himself. He was obviously very familiar with Amy, almost possessive this was no first time encounter. Yet Amy seemed merely dutiful. She cooperated with whatever the man seemed to want, and several times took the lead herself. 
but the smiles she gave him seemed forced, and whenever her face was turned away from his eye saw a grim look, never an expression of pleasure or excitement. I was left with more questions than answers. Now, in addition to, how could my loving wife have cheated on me? I had to wonder, why would Amy have spent more than two hours ducking a man she didn't seem at all excited by, when she would never do those things with me? Update 1. Amy and I had first met when I was 31, and she was only 20. A junior at the University of Cincinnati doing an internship in our office. We regularly offered jobs to interns interested in the video production business, and Amy was the best we had ever had. She was very bright, extremely responsible, and showed a lot of initiative. From the first moment I saw her I was attracted to Amy, but I was also aware that I needed to maintain a totally professional relationship with her. She worked many hours by my side in the editing booth, and I never touched her. We had a friendly, sometimes teasing, but completely appropriate relationship. On the last day of her internship, I was very tempted to ask her out, but I restrained myself. 31 and 20 didn't seem like such a good idea, and she wasn't even out of school yet. But two years later, I saw her again. Now graduated, she was applying for a position at the local CBS affiliate, and she stopped in to ask for an updated letter of recommendation. This time I didn't miss my chance, though I waited a couple of weeks until she landed the job. I invited her out to lunch, and we had a terrific time. It wasn't until more than a year later, when we were engaged to be married, that I learned the last visit had been a setup. During her internship, Amy had been as interested in me as I was in her, she used the updated letter of recommendation as an excuse to drop in and see me again, and it worked. I'd had my share of girlfriends, but never known a woman like Amy. Her energy and the joy she took in life made every moment around her a pleasure. She was not only beautiful, with sparkling eyes and a truly perfect figure, but charming and playful and intelligent. If it sounds like I was basically crazy about her, I was. We advanced from lunch dates to dinners, then to overnights and weekends together. Making love to Amy was completely delightful, at least at first. I always wanted to please her with a lot of foreplay, slow and tender touching, and then intercourse that was relaxed and lingering. I've never been into all that hard pounding, and it seemed that lovely as in every other way, Amy and I were a perfect match. She would lie back and enjoy my caresses. On other occasions, Amy would take the lead, massaging and stroking me all over. In fact, I gradually realized that as wonderful as love with Amy was, her range of preferences was rather narrow. I gently broached the latter possibility once or twice by caressing her bottom while we were making love. But when my fingers strayed near her opening, she stiffened and reached back to move them away. The second time I tried it, she said, Sorry, honey, I'm just not comfortable with that, okay? Of course that was okay. I adored Amy. And if our love life was a bit vanilla, it was still loving and exciting and frequent. And there were so many other ways in which we complimented one another. We both preferred to stay home most nights, making dinners out or parties the exceptions. We each loved cooking and shared a lot of pleasure in trying new recipes together. She liked to dry the dishes, while I preferred to wash. I adored having a beautiful younger woman for a wife, someone whom I could teach things to and be a protector for. And she loved feeling safe with me. She was a strong and independent woman. But she also liked being with someone a little older, who'd been out in the world longer. She teased me sometimes and called me old man. But we both understood that it was a playful and loving expression. We just both felt like we'd found the perfect match. The jigsaw piece that completed our own puzzle. I was a happy man. Update 2. Until now. What I saw that afternoon on the videotape destroyed me. It sickened me. And it confused me. I couldn't believe Amy would cheat on me, but she had. And I couldn't believe that my sweet wife, so conservative lovely, would happily let some other guy. Let alone duck her energetically in the as asterisk. But she had. She'd spent more than two hours getting this guy's rocks off, and if she hadn't seemed to enjoy it much, she'd certainly been an active and willing participant. I didn't know if my marriage was over, 
I couldn't imagine being without Amy, but I couldn't imagine going back to her either. How could I make love with her, return to our gentle and loving way of pleasing each other, while seeing her rolling around with that bastard asterisk D, giving him her as asterisk, letting him see hash M in her mouth. This had happened totally behind my back. I would have bet my house and my car on Amy's fidelity. How did I turn into that cliché? The coup asterisk seek holded husband. How would I ever be able to trust her again? Despite my long afternoon with that damned videotape, I got home before Amy. On Wednesdays, she worked a late shift and didn't come home until after 7 p.m. Usually, I would make dinner for us and have it ready when she arrived. So she was surprised to see me just sitting at the kitchen table when she came in. There was nothing cooking and the table wasn't set. In fact the lights weren't even on I was sitting in semi-darkness as dusk fell outside. Amy must have had a good day. Her eyes shone and her face showed her pleasure at seeing me. Hi sweetie, how was your day? Are we going out to dinner tonight? She said this last as she turned on the light and looked around the kitchen, failing to see any signs of food preparation. Not waiting for my answer, she plopped herself down in my lap and tried to give me a loving kiss. But I turned my face away, saying quietly, Amy, why don't you sit down over there? We need to talk. Amy's face turned serious, but not alarm. She sat down, saying, Is something wrong, Mark? I looked at her silently for a long moment, contemplating what was about to happen. The end of our happiness, well, the end of hers. Mine had ended hours earlier. No sense in prolonging the agony. I didn't feel any desire to torment her. Amy, how many other men have you ducked since we've been married? What? She half shouted, half gasped. She looked utterly shocked. Her face turned pale, and she just stared at me without moving. It's not a hard question, at least I hope it's not. I certainly hope that it's not so many that you've lost count. I couldn't resist the opportunity to be sarcastic. My anger was cool, almost intellectual. I knew I wasn't going to scream or throw things. Aware that she'd replied to my question with another question, I didn't answer. Instead I just looked at her, tapping my fingers a couple of times on the videotape, sitting in the middle of the table. I'd brought home a copy, after locking the original in a drawer at work. Amy glanced at the tape, then looked back at me. Her look showed horror, but also surprise. I said, You didn't know you were being taped? She shook her head, looking down at the floor. There was a long silence. Finally she said, Mark, I am so sorry. Jesus, I it happened only one time. I, I know that's probably not much consolation. More silence. Then, it meant nothing. It was it was just love. I didn't even enjoy it. She looked up at me. If you saw a tape of it, you must have seen that. It was awful I hated every minute of it. Suddenly she was crying, sobbing. I'm so sorry. She got up and tried to come into my arms, but I moved away from her. I didn't want to touch her. My urge to comfort her, my desire to dry her tears and make everything better, was overshadowed by my rage and confusion. I stepped away to the other side of the kitchen, leaving her standing by the table, sobbing, her hands hanging by her sides. She looked so young and so small. She cried for a long time, and I couldn't bring myself to comfort her. Finally, I got her the tissue box and a glass of water. She sat down, her crying gradually slowing to a trickle. She sighed, wiped her face, and drank some water. Looking at me, wearily, she said again, I'm so sorry, Mark. Shuddering at my own cruelty, but unable to hold back, I said, How do you even know who and what I saw on that tape? Her head shot up, and she glared at me, her face full of anger. Then, after a minute, that look gave way to one of resignation. Trust me, Mark, I know. It could only have been one afternoon, about four months ago. That's the only time I the only time I've even touched another man since we started dating. She said this quietly, but in a way that, as angry as I was, made me believe her. For one thing, if there had been other times, how could she be so confident of what was on the tape? More silence. 
suddenly, I didn't know what to do or say. I felt adrift terribly hurt, but also totally baffled. Tell me about it, I said. Tell me everything. Who, when, and above all why. Her weary face now showed something else. Just sorrow, perhaps, or a fear that hadn't been there before. Imploringly, she looked at me, stretching out her hand across the table towards mine, which remained just out of her reach. None of that matters, Mark. I love you more than I thought I could ever love anyone, and I know you know that. Please, just think of this as a mistake. A horrible, ugly, disgusting mistake. One that I'll spend the rest of my life making up to you for, if you'll let me. I stared at her in disbelief. That's it? It was a mistake? I'm supposed to say, okay? In that case, let's forget about it. Are you out of your mind? Amy, in case it slipped your mind, we vowed to forsake all others. That meant, not climb on a bed with some other guy and duck his brains out for two hours. You expect me just to accept your apology, without even knowing why the hell this happened. My voice was rising, and I tried to control my anger. How am I supposed to be sure this mistake won't happen again? With this guy or some other guy? Jesus, Amy how can I possibly trust you after this? No, sorry, but you're going to have to explain this. I'm not going to like it, but I have to hear it. You don't have to spell out the details I had the pleasure of seeing all of those. But you have to tell me why you ducked some other man. She was crying again, quietly, and shaking her head. Mark, I can't. I just can't. Can't you just trust me enough to believe me? When I say that nothing like this will ever happen again. I laughed at her, angrily. Trust you. You've got to be kidding, right? This is hardly the time to be asking me to trust you. For one thing, it was obviously not your first time with that as asterisk Holt. Yet here you are swearing you did it only once. She looked at me bleakly. I knew him from before, Mark. From California, before I met you. That made a certain amount of sense at least. It seemed possible. What's his name? Unwillingly, she said. Andy Darnton. And just what the hell were you doing ducking Mr. Andy Darnton up one wall and down the other? Is this because I'm older? Because I'm almost 40? Have I stopped being able to satisfy you in bed lately? And you figured you needed another taste of a younger guy. Amy had been calm, almost resigned, for a few minutes. But now she started sobbing again, her shoulders shaking almost uncontrollably. I could barely understand her words. Please, Mark, please. It's nothing like that you know I love the way you make love to me. I'm so sorry. I never meant to hurt you. And I swear I will never do this again as long as I live. Please, please don't make me talk about it. I just sat and stared at her as she wept. I had never experienced such a mixture of love, rage, sympathy, and utter bafflement. How could Amy possibly think I would let this go? It made no sense. She owed me an explanation hell. She owed me a lot more than that. But it had to start with an explanation. For the next 10 minutes, we went back and forth, getting nowhere. I tried being low-key and reasonable, but before long I was shouting, and she cowered away from me. With a curse, I got up and headed for the bedroom, leaving her crying at the kitchen table. A few minutes later, I was back in the kitchen, holding two suitcases I'd quickly packed. Amy, I don't know if our marriage can survive this. You know how much I love you? But you've hurt me more than you seem to understand. About the only thing I'm sure of is that if you won't tell me how and why this happened, how and why you ducked someone else, our marriage is over. You can reach me on my cell or at work. I headed for the door. Behind me, Amy howled in despair, begging me to stay, but I didn't look back. I heard her feet running towards me, but before she could reach me, I pulled the door shut behind me. Update 3 if there's anything on earth worse than finding out your wife has betrayed you, it has to be spending two weeks by yourself in a room at the Holiday Inn with plenty of time to think about it. Pretty much all I did for those two weeks was go to work, go back to the room, and brood about Amy. I alternated at frequent intervals between distraught, furious, and confused sometimes more than one at a time. What did I know? Not much. My wife had ducked someone else, someone she knew from her past. 
Was it really only once? Had she really not wanted to do it? Then why do it? And why so uninhibitedly, giving her body to him in ways she denied me? Amy called me repeatedly. I never answered either of my phones, so she left me impassioned, desperate, pleading messages. At first, there were several every day. Then they gradually slowed to once a day or so. She loved me. She was lost without me. Wouldn't I please come home? Couldn't we work this out, somehow? A few times I called her back. She was thrilled to hear from me, breathless with relief. But when I made clear that I wouldn't even consider returning until she explained her adultery, the wild sobbing began again. Every conversation was the same, painful and frustrating. After about a week, I simply stopped returning her calls. After a couple of days, I decided to track down Mr. Andy Darnton, if that was even his real name. I did a Google search and found some surprising information. Mr. Darnton, age 32, had been killed in a traffic accident about two weeks before I received the videotape. Seems he ran a red light and got hit by an UPS truck. The newspaper article said he was married to a Patricia Romano and they lived in the suburbs of Cincinnati. For lack of anything better to try, I got the Darton's home number and called it. When a woman answered I said, I'm calling to speak with Patricia Romano. Please this is Mark Bernier. There was a long silence, and then she said, I wondered if you would call. We met at a coffee shop in her neighborhood that afternoon. She was a tall, slim, good-looking woman, about 30, with short black hair. She looked tired and unhappy. Thank you for meeting me, Miss Romano, I said. I was sorry to hear about your husband. He was a lying, cheating prick, she replied with a sad smile. But I loved him, and I didn't know about most of the cheating until after he died. Was it you who sent me that videotape? I asked. Yes, and I'm truly sorry if I hurt you or ruined your marriage. I was pretty upset, and I wasn't thinking all that clearly. Over several cups of coffee, she told me that she and Andy had met in California two years earlier. She'd fallen in love with him, and they'd married after just a few months. About a year ago, they'd moved to Cincinnati so he could take a job managing a couple of strip joints, the same kind of work he'd done in California. Patricia had had reason to suspect Andy cheated on her, but nothing concrete to go on. Then, after his accident, she was cleaning out the house and found four hidden videotapes, each with a woman's name neatly lettered on it. To her horror, they'd turned out to be tapes of Andy having love with a different woman on each tape. The tapes had clearly been made in their bedroom, which hurt her all the more. Without thinking much about the consequences, she had tracked down the husbands of three of the women. The other one was single and mailed the tapes to us anonymously. She wanted the women who'd been ducking her husband to suffer and figured that would be the easiest way of making it happen. Again, I'm very sorry, Mr. Dernier. Between grieving for Andy and hating the son of a B asterisk TCH, I wasn't thinking too clearly. It must have been awful for you. Do you know if your husband knew Amy or any of the other women from before your marriage? I asked her. She looked thoughtful. I don't know. It's possible. But he never spoke much to me about the women in his life before I knew him. And the tapes were too upsetting for me to watch much of once I saw what each one was I stopped watching them. Back in my hotel room, I wondered what I'd learned. At least Amy had told me one thing that was true. The name of her lover. But that still left me with far too many questions to answer. And far too much pain that I didn't know how to resolve. After about two weeks, Amy stopped leaving me phone messages. I didn't know what that meant, but then a day later I got a letter at work. I opened it and read it hopefully. But it was the same thing as before. Passionate, loving, apologetic, but utterly without the explanation I had demanded from her. She closed the letter by begging me to come home, or at least to call her. In a rage, I tore the letter to pieces and dropped them in the trash. Five more letters came nearly one a day for the next week. Feeling somewhat calmer, I couldn't quite bear to throw them out, so I dropped them into a drawer without reading them. On the 25th day after walking out, I woke up in the morning angry and resolved. That's it, duck it. I'm not letting this drag on. 
I called the lawyer who did the legal work for our business and asked him to start on the paperwork for a divorce. When he asked what was going on, I explained that Amy had cheated on me, but that I simply wanted a basic no-fault divorce. We could split all our assets in half, and thank God there were no children. I asked him how soon he could have Amy served with the papers, and he said it wouldn't take more than a couple of days. Two days later Amy left a wild, howling, despairing message on my office phone. How could I do this to her? Didn't I know she loved me, and would do anything for me? Wouldn't I please talk to her, come home to her, let her back into my life? The message just made me tired and sad, of course. There seemed no point in even calling her back, and I didn't. Update 4. About a week after the divorce papers were served, I walked into my office and was shocked to see Margaret Selvin sitting in a chair waiting for me. Margaret was Amy's older sister, by nearly 13 years. She lived in Seattle with her husband and two children. I'd only met her a handful of times at our wedding and at some family holidays, but I liked and respected her. In fact, I felt that we were friends, despite our limited time together. Hello, Mark, how are you? I went over and kissed her cheek. I'm okay, thanks, under the circumstances. I assume Amy has told you what's going on. Yes, she said. That's why I'm in Cincinnati. When I spoke to her on the phone four days ago, she sounded so awful that I got frightened and hopped on a plane. I really thought she might do something to herself. I felt a hole in the pit of my stomach. I'm sorry, Margaret, I had no idea. I haven't seen Amy in weeks or talked to her recently. Mark, I won't waste your time. I have always liked you, and I think you like me too. You know I think you have been a terrific husband to Amy you've made her happier than she's ever been before. I'm here to ask you a favor. Will you come back to the house with me and see her? I sighed. I'm not sure there's much point. Margaret, she won't tell me why she cheated on me, no matter how much I ask. I just can't get past this. It's time for both of us to move on with our lives. She looked hard at me. That's it you're ready to give up on her? You don't love Amy anymore. I didn't say I didn't love her. But what she did tore me apart, Margaret. I can't get past it, and I can't understand it. And with each passing day, it gets a little easier not to love her. And a little easier to imagine my future without her in it. What would it take to get you to see her, Mark? That's easy. I replied. She has to tell me all about it, who that guy was to her, and why she spent the afternoon bouncing on his bed. She says it was a mistake that will never happen again. If she can't be honest with me, there's no point in our even talking. Margaret leaned forward, looking intently at me. What if I can get her to tell you the story, Mark? Would you listen? Would you try to understand, to see her side of it? Of course, Margaret. I got a little hot. Just try not to lean so hard on me, okay? I'm not the one caught with my pants down in someone else's bed. Did she tell you all of what she was doing on that tape? She sighed. Yes, Mark. And it's pretty awful. Believe me, it's not hard for me to imagine how you feel. We sat for a few moments in silence. Margaret, if you can make Amy understand that she needs to tell me the reason she ducked Andy Darnton, then I'll come back to the house and hear her. And I'll try I'll try to be patient and understanding. Though it's hard to imagine what would make it all right. Thanks, Mark. I'll call you. Two days later, I drove up to the house. Margaret had called to say that Amy would tell me the whole story. I didn't really believe it, but I had promised to give her a chance. Margaret greeted me at the door, leading me into the living room where Amy sat on the sofa. She looked awful. She was wearing her bathrobe. Her hair was dirty and uncombed, and there were huge bags under her eyes. She also appeared to have lost 10 pounds or more. I had feared she might throw herself into my arms when she saw me. But all she did was look up at me, saying, Hello, Mark, in a quiet, defeated voice. Her eyes were dull and lifeless. Hello, Amy, I said quietly. I didn't say anything else, and after a minute or two Amy began to speak. Her voice was low and without inflection. She spoke for a long time, without looking at me, instead gazing abstractedly across the room. 
what Amy told me. Margaret has persuaded me, I need to tell you this, Mark. I know that once you hear the story, that will be the end for us, that's why I couldn't tell you. But Margaret has helped me see that if I don't tell you, you will go ahead and divorce me. So it seems like it doesn't matter much either way. You remember that my dad died the summer right before I started at UCLA? Well, after that there was never enough money. I had a scholarship, but it wasn't enough. I got some different part-time jobs, waitressing, doing temp work, but I wasn't going to be able to pay my spring semester bill. Then a girl in my dorm told me she had worked for a year in a club as an exotic dancer. But she told me that it didn't go any further than that. No lap dancing unless you wanted to and nobody harassed her. The management was good about protecting the girls. And the money was fantastic ten times what a waitress could make. I didn't think I could ever do anything like that. I was pretty innocent then, Mark, and it scared the hell out of me. But I was also desperate. So I went to the club, and they hired me. It wasn't as bad as I feared it would be. I got over the embarrassment pretty quickly. It became just a job, like typing or serving hamburgers. Showing off my body just became routine. And on the rare occasions when a guy tried to grab me off the stage, the bouncers quickly tossed him out on his as asterisk. So I felt safe enough. Andy Darnton, the guy in the video took over as the manager of the club after I'd been there a few months. He was very professional with me and the other girls, never leering at us or sneaking back into the dressing room. He asked me out to dinner a few weeks after he got there, and before long we were dating. He was older and sophisticated, and I felt safe with him. I wasn't a virgin when I met him, but I didn't know much about love, and he taught me. But it was never awful, Mark. He was gentle and kind to me. I even thought I loved him after a while. He taught me lots of new positions and how to give a good bee job. At the time I never saw it, but looking back I can see now that he was gradually easing me towards more and more slew asterisk tty things. But he was always kind about it, never forced me or scared me. Until one night in my sophomore year, after I'd been seeing him nearly a year, he took me to a fancy nightclub where some of the movie stars went, and it was really exciting. He'd given me ecstasy, which we did together once in a while, and that plus a few drinks had me really flying. We went back to his place, and he had me put on some really slew asterisk TTY looking stockings and a garter belt, and we started to have love. I don't remember everything that happened, but we were doing it spoon fashion on his bed, him pushing into me from behind and I was very turned on. And suddenly, there was another man in the room, a much older guy. He was kind of fat, and had silver hair, and he had to be 50 or so. He was just standing there, gazing at us, and then he started taking off all his clothes. And Andy was pumping into me. And then the old guy climbed onto the bed, and moved his tool towards my mouth. I don't really know why I didn't scream, or try to get away. I was so high. From the ecstasy and the alcohol, I thought maybe I was dreaming it. And Andy held me tight, and crooned in my ear to go ahead. Just please Tommy with my mouth. So I did it. I wasn't really all there, but I had Andy ducking me from behind and Tommy ducking my mouth. And then it just went on and on, and got worse and worse. They pulled out of me and switched. And this fat old man I'd never seen before was ducking me while Andy was making me blow him. And then Andy was on his back, with me lying on top of him ducking him, and Tommy climbed up behind me. I screamed, because it hurt like hell. I lost all track of time, and they just kept doing things to me, using me in different ways. Finally it was over. I was half unconscious, still high, and I felt so ashamed. My boyfriend and his friend had used me like a whore. I was just lying there knack asterisk ed on the bed and I think they thought I was asleep. I saw Tommy getting his clothes on, grinning at Andy. Andy said, didn't I tell you she'd be hot? And Tommy said she was fantastic. I can hardly wait to do her again. Then Tommy pulled out his wallet and put some money on the dresser. And he said, I'll give you the rest when you send me the video. And Andy told him he'd copy it the next day and send it to him. And then Tommy was gone and Andy was back on top of me, grinning saying, hey, Amy, wasn't that terrific? 
He was all excited again, and he ducked me once more while I lay there, eyes closed, wishing with all my might that it was just a bad dream. The next day I sneaked out of bed while Andy was still asleep. I went back to the dorm, scrubbed myself over and over in the shower, then packed up all my stuff and went straight to the bus station. One of my friends was from San Antonio and had told me she loved it there. So I got a bus ticket and rode for 26 hours to San Antonio. I got a waitressing job, found a shitty little apartment, and just hid out for six months. I had the irrational fear that Andy would come after me and take me back, and I was terrified. Of course, I see now that he wouldn't have bothered to chase me there were plenty more like me right back at the strip club. When I finally felt a little less scared, I filed a bunch of transfer applications, all to colleges far from Latin. I had good grades from UCLA, except for the semester I dropped out in the middle of, and the University of Cincinnati made me a good scholarship offer. So I came here. You know most of the rest. For a long time I was too messed up to date anybody at all. When we got together I hadn't been with a man since Andy. I was scared to death. But you were so gentle and loving, Mark. You've always made love to me like a lover and husband, never treated me like a whore. Of course, you didn't know about that. And so with you I could pretend I was just a regular, normal woman. A couple of times you wanted to be more. Adventurous, like having anal love. And I just freaked out and stopped you. It made me think of Lay again, and what Andy made me do, and I just couldn't handle it. Thank God you were so understanding, and never pushed me. After ten years I thought about Andy and lot less and less. And I thought it was behind me the shame of it my being a whore like that. I didn't realize I just pushed it all down deep inside, so I didn't have to look at it. Six months ago Andy called me out of the blue. He'd moved to Cincinnati, and by complete chance he saw my picture in the paper for that article they did on TV stations and community service. He knew right away it was me, even though the article used my married name, and he called me. It scared me to death to hear his voice. I hung up on him twice then stopped answering my phone. But he left me a voicemail message. He had a wonderful videotape I might like to see, and I'd better call him back, because otherwise he might have to show it to some other people, like my husband and my boss. So I called him. He wanted money, and he wanted to see me again. I knew he had a tape of me with him and Tommy, and I knew he'd send it to you if I didn't meet with him. I didn't know what else to do, Mark. It would have meant the end of my job at the station. But I didn't even care about that. What I cared about was you. If you knew what a whore I'd been, I'd lose you. So I played him. I went to his house, knowing he'd want to duck me first and then demand money from me. Andy always used to fall asleep after we'd had a lot of love. Once he was asleep, nothing would wake him he could sleep through an earthquake. So I could search his house and maybe I'd get lucky and find the tape he had of me. When he was asleep, I looked around and found a whole pile of tapes. There must have been a couple dozen of them, all neatly labeled. I found three copies of the one with me, and a bunch of others with different names on them. I put them all in a trash bag and left. I drove to a restaurant and dropped the bag into a big dumpster in back that was already half full of trash. Then I came home and tried to wash the smell of him, and the feel of him off me. I must have stood in that shower, crying, for more than an hour. I really thought I was free of him, Mark. I didn't hear from him again. And then a couple of weeks ago, he was killed in an accident. I can't say I was too sorry. I didn't realize I had anything to worry about until you came home with that tape. Stupid me, I should have figured he'd be taping me again, just like the other time. I don't know how you got it, but it doesn't much matter. So now you know. He made me a who hashri And I played the whore with him one more time. So I would never have to tell you the truth and see the disgust in your eyes. But it didn't work. And now you can go back out the door. And no one will blame you a bit. Who would want to be married to a woman who did what I did? Got herself pimped out to a stranger by her own boyfriend. Ducked two guys at once. Let them take her in her cun asterisk t and her as asterisk at the same time, and get it all recorded in living color. There was silence in the room. I looked over at Margaret, 
and saw she had been crying. Then I felt the tears on my own cheeks. I expected Amy to be crying too, or glaring defiantly at me, but she was still just staring off into space. I went over, sat on the sofa next to Amy, and gathered her gently into my arms. She looked at me, shocked, and when she saw I was smiling at her, she started to cry. I held her, my face pressed into her hair, while she sobbed and shuddered. While I held her, I remembered a conversation we'd had when we were first engaged. I'd told Amy we should talk about our romantic pasts, the people we'd been involved with, and she got a very strange, closed look on her face. That's all in the past, Mark, she had said firmly. I don't need or want to know about your girlfriends, and I hope you won't make me talk about the people I was involved with. Now that I'm with you, and we're so happy, can't we just have a clean slate? She had looked so intent and serious at that moment that of course I agreed. Now, I understood for the first time what painful experiences she had been shielding me from and trying to forget herself. After many minutes of crying in my arms, Amy finally calmed down. When she finally turned and looked at me again, I was still smiling. Her face turned hard, and she angrily smacked me on the arm with her fist. Okay, Mark, you've done your duty. You've listened to my story. You've let me have a good cry. You've played the loving husband one last time, now go. Don't make me look at you anymore. Sorry, I said, still smiling at her. You're stuck with me. Then I held her as she cried some more. Epilogue. Amy let me take her into the shower, where I lovingly shampooed her hair, washed her all over, then dried her and tucked her into bed. She slept for 13 hours, undoubtedly making up for a few sleepless nights. I called her boss and arranged for some medical leave. Then Margaret helped me find a therapist for Amy to see. I was a bit surprised when Amy balked at first, claiming she had nothing to talk about. But between me and Margaret we persuaded her to go. We didn't make love again for nearly two weeks. But every night when we went to bed Amy snuggled up against me as close as possible, as though afraid I might sneak away during the night. Some nights she had bad dreams. Once or twice I did. But when one or the other of us came awake with a shudder, frightened, the other was there with soothing words. One Friday evening when I got home from work Amy was nowhere to be found. Not in the living room or the kitchen. Not in the basement or out in the yard. I searched around, calling for her. When I came into our bedroom she was sitting up in bed, smiling sweetly at me, not a stitch of clothing on. Honey, it's time, was all she said. Our love making that night was pure vanilla, and it was the happiest night of my life, or at least tied with the day Amy had agreed to marry me. We were slow and gentle, we kissed and cuddled, murmured love words to one another, and coupled sweetly. After that things got better fast. Amy's therapist helped her understand what had happened in her relationship with Andy, all the ways in which she was not a guilty party but a victim and she began to see that it was okay to be a fully love you person, to let herself enjoy things beyond the vanilla, without feeling like a whore. Once Amy was back at work full-time, after about three weeks, life began to feel more normal for both of us. With each of us busy at our jobs, the focus wasn't exclusively, and painfully, on our marital and love you troubles. We shared stories about work, colleagues, plans for the future, we took a long weekend to go hiking and canoeing. We cooked some good dinners and got together more often with friends. It was a while after that before we felt we were all the way back. But I knew for certain we were getting there one Saturday morning. I was vaguely aware of Amy leaving the bed early, but I fell back asleep. An hour later, she gently shook me awake, smiling broadly. I sat up and looked around the bedroom. There on a tray was breakfast in bed toast, bacon, juice, and coffee. I looked over at Amy, my eyebrows raised. She grinned back. I thought we could have some breakfast first, then stay in and play this morning. There are some things we've never done together that I'd like to try with you. How does that sound? I kissed her and said that it sounded pretty good to me. The end. Thanks for watching. Remember, revolving time exists because of your support. So take care of yourself and see you soon with another story.